Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're talking about OIDC, or I guess in better terms, how I got away from uh, encoding any credentials for cloud providers in my CI systems. Uh, so I, I no longer have to have credentials, which is really, really powerful. Uh, and I wanted to talk you through how OIDC works, uh, OpenID Connect, and how it's leveraged to make you know, hard-coded credentials for cloud providers, a thing of the past. Uh, now note that OIDC and OpenID Connect and, and OpenID and OAuth 2 actually encompasses a whole bunch of different technologies, and it can actually be used for implementing things like single sign-on or, uh, you know, external login providers and things like that. We're not going to really talk about that side of OIDC today. Um, but we will be talking about uh, providers and consumers, which kind of plays into the same, the, the same spec. So we're just going to be covering particular use cases for CI and kind of how that works. But you can imagine taking these same principles and applying them to those types of systems as well. Uh, anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so the example that we're going to be talking about today is uh, GitHub Actions and interacting with AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services. In particular, we're going to be using S3 as an example. No particular service you know, doesn't really matter. I'm just, I just picked that one arbitrarily. Uh, and so traditionally, when you would talk to AWS from GitHub Actions, you would encode the key pair, the AWS key pair, the access key ID and secret access key variables, secrets, into your GitHub Action workflow. You would uh, load those secrets using AWS configure or write them directly to the AWS credentials file. And then it would use that key pair to talk to AWS. Essentially a hard coded credential, what we want to avoid by the end of this video. And so this is kind of the like traditional way that you can think about a key pair and how you would talk to AWS. Basically you have, you have creds on disk uh, and you, you know, send them over the wire and those creds are static and don't expire. Uh, and this, you know, has some security implications in that if somebody were able to steal these somehow, uh, they don't expire. So, I mean, you can manually expire them, but by default, they don't expire. So if somebody managed to grab these, they have the keys to the castle. They can do anything indefinitely in AWS until those credentials are rotated. Um, credential rotation is also kind of a pain because it means you have to kind of do a two-step process where you introduce new cred credentials I three-step process. Introduce new creds, start using the new creds, and rotate out the old one. Um, and so you kind of need some way to hand off credentials. Kind of a pain in the butt. Um, but anyway, so I think it's fairly clear that hard-coded credentials in this case are worse in security practices and more of a pain to deal with unless you don't rotate. And then if you don't rotate, well then, you got a whole different problem going on. Um, I wanted to talk about, before we get into OpenID Connect, I wanted to talk about a similar technology that is in play in AWS. And if you're using AWS services, you're actually using something very similar all the time, but it doesn't use OpenID Connect at all. But I wanted to throw it out there as just like a, a similar example and how uh, tokenless authentication happens all the time in AWS. And this is a simple example. So say you're running an EC2 instance or Lambda or literally anything, and you want to talk to S3. Now, typically you don't load a hard-coded credential onto your EC2 instance. You do what's called assuming a role. And the way that works is a request is made to the uh, secure token service. That's what STS stands for, uh, a service inside AWS. And it basically says, I want to assume this role. I have this service EC2. And somewhere you've defined an AWS role that is allowed to be assumed by this particular service. Uh, AWS validates all of this you know, via the metadata service, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but basically what STS does is it trusts this service because it's within AWS and you've already configured it with that particular role. And it will issue you temporary credentials uh, and you will use then use those temporary credentials to make your actual request. And the important part here is that uh, you kind of establish some trust you know, AWS implicitly trusts itself and you've configured a role that it can be assumed in this particular way. And so that allows you to acquire tokenless temporary credentials and make a request to S3. Now, OIDC works very similarly to this, uh, except the, uh, you know, uh, 
AWS can't implicitly trust your GitHub action workflow. And so a little bit more work needs to go into it. And so this is kind of the, the diagram for this. And I'm gonna break down each of these steps and kind of talk about them in particular. Oh, you got my drawing history, great. Um, and in order to introduce that, we kind of, uh, kind of have to talk about how this trust is established. And the way that it's established is via a JW2, JWT, a JSON web token. And uh, GitHub's particular uh, JSON web token, the, they also call it the OIDC token, uh, basically includes a bunch of information and is signed by GitHub. And that signing is what AWS can use to validate that this was uh, created by the OIDC provider. GitHub is an OIDC provider. And it can trust the information inside of it. And then based on some configuration on, that you configure on the AWS side, it can then provide credentials or provide a role, uh, those same temporary credentials that we talked about before. And again, this is actually handled through the secure token service, the, the same service that is done for a sum role in, um, in a pure AWS environment. Um, and so this is kind of the basics of how this gets set up. You configure an action, or you set up, use an action called configure AWS credentials, and I'll actually show you a full workflow later. Uh, this action performs uh, the first step, which is retrieving the JWT from what GitHub calls their ID token service. Now you might think, wait, can't any action request an ID token? Uh, and the answer is no, you need to explicitly opt into a particular permission such that your action can request a token. Because uh, otherwise you could just generate arbitrary tokens, well not arbitrary tokens, you could generate tokens in any workflow and then you know, uh, an unprivileged workflow could suddenly hit STS and you wouldn't want that happening. Uh, so you have to explicitly opt in and the way you opt in is via ID token write. And this is only permitted in a very uh, small subset of workflows, like it, it can't be in pull requests, for example. It has to be in a privileged workflow, uh, such as like push or pull request target or other things like that. Um, but anyway, going back to our little drawing here. Uh, so we request that JWT. This basically spits out a bunch of information about the current context that's being run. Uh, it includes, among other things, uh, the repo that you're running in. Um, if you're dealing with deployment environments, it'll have an deployment uh, or an environment here. If you're dealing with, uh, usually it'll run on a branch and it'll tell you the branch in that. That sub is kind of the default field that's used to validate on the other side. Uh, but you'll notice that it has all sorts of other information about the current running context. Like it'll tell you, you know, uh, the repository owner ID, for instance, or the workflow name, or what event triggered this basically a whole bunch of other information that you may want to filter and be able to configure your uh, your thing that receives the JWT on the other end to potentially you know harden your security like maybe you only want things to happen if you have i don't know a particular actor like maybe maybe you're you only are allowed to assume a role if the actor is asatili and you don't want some other random Joe on your team to be able to acquire these credentials or something like that. I don't know, you can, you can imagine like you can filter on any of these other different fields. Um, and so what you do on the AWS side is you configure uh, the secure token service. Well, actually you configure this via the IAM manager um, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. But you basically tell it like what filter on sub that you want, um, what token provider, as the input, because you have to tell it like, hey, I'm using GitHub, so I want to use the GitHub token provider, uh, and then what role to assume. And so it'll basically get the other side of that. Um, and uh, I think I talked about it briefly, but the trust is established by signing the JWT so that AWS knows, okay, GitHub created this. Uh, I know that I can trust its contents, and then from its contents, I can derive information and provide a token back. Um, and just as before, STS responds with temporary credentials, and those are used to access S3. Um, I actually didn't mention it here, but these temporary credentials, both in the case where you're doing a sum role as well as when you're uh, using OIDC to get temporary credentials, these have a limited lifetime. I believe it's an hour by default, but I don't remember the specifics. And I guess the, the duration varies based on the cloud provider. 
speaking specifically about AWS. Spoilers, we'll get to uh, other providers in a bit. Uh, but these temporary credentials have a limited lifetime. So if somebody were to compromise a workflow, they would only be able to compromise these temporary credentials. And you know, an hour later, those credentials are completely worthless. Now, if they could change the code, they could you know, acquire a new token and continue to have problems there. But uh, the tokens themselves are significantly lower risk than the hard-coded credentials before because they automatically expire, which is really great. Um, I promised that I would show you the STS configuration. So I have an example for, uh, this is actually for pre-commit CI. Uh, this is the runner, or no, this is the ECR deploy role, which I use to push a GitHub image using this workflow here to ECR, Amazon's Elastic Container Registry, which is terribly named because it actually stores images, not containers, but I don't know why everyone called there's something CR. like. Uh, Microsoft's is called MCR, and no, it's not My Chemical Romance. Um, but anyway, that's a whole different rant. Uh, so this workflow sets ID token right, which basically says I want to be able to access the ID token service. Now, this actually doesn't take effect during the pull request event here. It only takes effect during push uh, the push event um, because you can't request more than the maximum uh, permissions. Uh, but that's a whole different <laughs> get it back to this thing. Anyway, uh, so you opt into ID token. Uh, you then use configure ADOS credentials. I have a fork so that I can use branch protection and actions hardening to only allow uh, actions within my organization. So this is actually just a trivial fork of the ADOS uh, configure ADOS credentials action. You tell it what real role to assume. This isn't actually a secret, so I probably could have used vars. I think I actually wrote this before GitHub had a separate namespace between non-secret variables and secret variables, although maybe I just didn't know about it. Um, but this is actually not a secret value. Like a, an R in for a role is just like your account ID and the role name, and there's nothing, there's nothing secret about that. Uh, so this could have just been you know, either hard-coded, plain text, or a variable in the workflow, because uh, I don't care if people know it. Uh, but basically, this action does what we did, what we talked about before. You know, acquire a JWT from the ID token service, and then use that JWT to ask AWS for the credentials. And then finally, uh, at the end, this uh, push action actually does the Docker push, and so it uses the token that was acquired here to perform a side effect on ECR. Um, now, I wanted to show you the other side of this, where you what you configure in AWS. You basically set up a uh, OIDC provider, and you tell it the authority. In this case, the uh, well, I think it's AUD. Okay. Oh no, this is the audience. This is the authority. I don't remember the terminology, but basically, you say this is where I expect an OIDC request to come from. Token.actions.githubusercontent.com. This is the I believe. The same, I believe this is called the OIDC provider, and this is the thing that signs that JWT. Uh, then you tell it a series of conditions. This is validated against the particular fields of the JWT. So odd is audience, and the um, this configure AWS credentials modifies the default odd uh, to. Um, to specifically say that it's going to STS. This is a, a hardening technique to say like, okay, well, we expect to get this from a particular value, and so we're gonna get that same constant value on the other side. Uh, and then the other thing is validated against sub. Sub is the subject, and if we look at the default subject here, well, this one's actually different than the one we'll see, because uh, we're not actually using GitHub deployments. We're using uh, just normal actions. And so we will see a sub that looks like this, Repo is pre-commit CI slash runner image, and reference is refs heads main. So this is saying uh, only give out this assume role, or only allow this assume role to happen if it is specifically the pre-commit CI runner image repo and specifically the main branch. So no other branches can acquire this token. Uh, now you may imagine a different scenario where you may want to, I don't know, deploy a pull request to a development environment. And we don't have to imagine this. I have an example of this, which is uh, the pre-commit CI runner. This is actually a, 
uh, EC2 image, um, an AMI. And so one, one part of deploying this is I need to be able to uh, try out particular pull requests in a development environment. And so I have a separate OIDC configuration here for runner deploy, different role. And you can see here that this part is all basically the same, still the same provider, it's still the same audience. Um, but my sub now has a wildcard. Uh, you'll see that it allows the pre-commit CI slash runner repo, but it has sort of a wildcard in the end, allowing any branch to push. Uh, now it's a private repo, and you know, I'm basically the only person working on this. So uh, in a way, this, this allows any feature branch to acquire a token here. And so I can perform deployments from a, uh, a pull request branch. Um, OK, so that's kind of the like overview of about how this works, how the data flows between each of these parts, uh, and how you know you can see here I have no hard-coded credentials except for the, the one that I don't need to hard-code, the secret here. Uh, not actually a secret. I'll probably follow up by removing that. Um, but you can, you know, oops, just jumping ahead here. Uh, you can use this to acquire a temporary credential using your cloud provider without needing to uh, hard code any key pairs here. And the cool thing about this is it can actually be used with a whole bunch of different cloud providers or not even cloud providers. So GitHub talks a bunch about like you know AWS, Google Cloud, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, somewhere in here. Yeah. Yeah. Azure, GCP. I guess it doesn't talk about Oracle, but... AshiCorp Vault, surprised that is uh, considered a cloud provider. But uh, one of them that I think is really, really cool is you can actually do this with PyPI. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with PyPI, this is the package index for Python. And you can hook up an OIDC provider to PyPI using its web interface. And this will allow a secure publishing of a package from CI without needing to hook up any credentials, without having a PyPI API token, you just tell it, I think it's repo workflow name and repository. Yeah, so org repo workflow name, and you can, if you're using um, deployment environments, you can use environment name as well. Uh, but this hooks up an OIDC connect uh, to GitHub, and basically the same flow as this. You can imagine instead of AWS, it's, um, it is uh, PyPI. There's no STS here. The JWT is just passed directly to PyPI and validates the upload that way. I think. I don't actually know. <laughs> I haven't looked into the, the Twine implementation, but my guess is it just it doesn't have an intermediate token service. It just uses the JWT as the uh, the auth and auth. <laughs> Authentication and authorization. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's OIDC. Um, I didn't talk about all the other ways you can use OIDC to implement other stuff, but I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. I hope you found this useful. I know a lot of you have been waiting a long time for this video, so it is finally here. Uh, if you have additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.